Well, good evening. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be with you this Saturday evening, October 29th, 2005. We are going to have a guest tonight. His name is Eric Dondero, and he's going to tell us why the Bush um, program in the Middle East has proven to be an outstanding success. And I think that's going to rile the natives a bit. So you may want to make a phone call to 1-800-259-9231. Uh, that's 1-800-259-9231. Uh, before we get to uh, Eric, however, which will be in the second segment, uh, I would like to remind you that yesterday was Statue of Liberty Day. That was the day back in 1888 when the Statue of Liberty was uh, unveiled in New York Harbor and uh, eventually put. Uh, uh, it was erected on Liberty Island, as it was called, and eventually the United States Park Service took it over and made it a U.S. national park, which is kind of an oxymoron to have the Statue of Liberty on government property because the whole idea of the Statue of Liberty was that this was a country in which the government didn't run things, the government didn't own things, the government didn't ask for your papers, the government didn't fasten a number on you, the government didn't extort a percentage of your income for, in order for you to earn a living. And people came here from all over the world looking for a better life, a life of freedom, away from the old world where governments seemed to know best for everybody, where chancellors and czars and kaisers and um, monarchs and kings and queens all seemed to rule the roost and tell people how to live. And here was a country in which people were free to pursue the dreams that they always had all of their lives. And it was ironic also that in 1888, we were getting close to the point where America was going to start deteriorating. There were, of course, intrusions on the Constitution all through the 19th century, but most of the time they were reversed after a short period of time. But then about the turn of the century, about the beginning of the 1900s, everything began to change. It was during those late 1800s that we got the Interstate Commerce Commission. We got the Federal Trade Commission. We got these various regulatory agencies. And eventually we got the FDA and the SEC and the, the FCC and all of these other regulatory agencies that would determine what we could listen to, what we could see, what we could do, what we could buy, uh, what we could put in our bodies. And all of this developed during the, the 1900s. And then in 1913, uh, under the tutelage of Woodrow Wilson, the income tax amendment made its way through Congress and was uh, available then for uh, was available then was, was available then uh, for ratification by the states, which happened. And in 1913, the first income tax was passed. And that income tax had a maximum rate of six percent. But as we all know, every government program, once it's in effect, grows and grows and grows and grows. And as a result. Uh, we now have an income tax with a high rate of 50%, and we've had them as high as 91%. Also in 1913, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, System was founded. It was founded ostensibly as a private corporation in order to get around the Constitution, which did not permit a national bank. But you know and I know it is a government uh, enterprise. The chairman of the Federal Reserve Board is appointed by the president, and uh, a lot of the rest of its policies are determined by the federal government, but more than anything else, whatever profits the Federal Reserve Bank makes, any Federal Reserve Bank makes, is returned above a simple nominal dividend. Above that is returned to the U.S. Treasury, and hundreds of billions of dollars have gone into the U.S. Treasury. And when uh, people who think that the Federal Reserve Bank is private say that the bankers have reaped billions of dollars in interest, they haven't. The bankers haven't reaped, reaped any particular amount in interest from the Federal Reserve Banks. All that money has gone to the Treasury. What the bankers have done is to be able to use the Federal Reserve Bank to create the Federal Reserve Banks to create money uh, that allows them to earn interest on uh, loans that they make with money that they create out of thin air. So it's like the farm subsidies, the, the banking subsidies of the Federal Reserve System. It's just one more big government program. And uh, on and on it goes. If it hadn't been for the income tax, then the U.S. would never have been able to finance its way into World War I. And if the U.S. had never gotten into World War I, we probably never would have had a communist empire. And we probably never would have had a Hitler in Germany because the Germans would have had a negotiated peace with the British and the French that would not have devastated Germany and not created the conditions by which a thug like Adolf Hitler could march into Germany and promise the Germans retribution for all that the, the British and French wreaked upon the Germans at the end of World War I and wreaked it with the support of the American government. Uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, promised when he took America into war in the 1917 uh, a peace without victors, a peace in which uh, there would be no winners and losers, but rather it would be a peace that would establish peace for all time and and uh, bring democracy to the world. Uh, uh, and as a result of the, that democracy in the world, there would be no more wars. But, of course, immediately wars broke out all over Europe during the 1920s, and in the 1930s we had the Great Depression uh, brought about by the Federal Reserve's monetary policies of the 1920s and combined with the monetary policies of the Bank of England. 
and on and on it goes, on, on into World War II, which, as I said, would probably never have happened if it hadn't been for the U.S. getting into World War I. And if we hadn't had World War II, we probably would never have had the communists taking over Eastern Europe or China, and uh, we never would have had a Cold War. We never would have had a Korean War, a Vietnam War, and so the dominoes keep falling, one after another, as a result of abandoning the Constitution way back there and abandoning the ideals uh, that are exemplified in the Statue of Liberty. That wonderful poem that uh, Emma Lazarus wrote, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the tempest-tossed, the homeless, to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. We need to lift that lamp again and light it, providing light and hope and inspiration to the entire world. Not bullying, not demands, not coercion, not shock and awe, not brute force, not violence, but liberty, the hope, the peace, the inspiration to the entire world. Then we will see peace in this world. Then we will see democracy. And now I would like to introduce Eric Dondero, who is a, uh, a, a translation expert who speaks many languages and who specializes in helping people learn English as well as other languages. He is a former top staffer for U.S. Congressman Ron Paul, and he is the founder of the Republican Liberty Caucus, which is a group of Republicans who call themselves libertarians, and he is also one of the co-founders of the neo-libertarian movement, which he calls, which supports free market economic civil liberties, but a hawkish pro-military foreign policy, a la P.J. O'Rourke, is the way Eric describes it. And he is the author of a multilingual, worldwide multilingual phrasebook and survival skills for over 40 languages for busy travelers who need to learn languages fast. That's his specialty. But in his uh, not-too-spare time, he writes uh, articles and emails that go out on the Internet, and he's a big supporter of the Bush policies. And on October 17th, he wrote, just after the Constitution vote, he said, the events of last weekend were simply amazing. It is now safe to conclude that the war in Iraq has been the most successful military and political campaign in our entire nation's history, even possibly eclipsing World War II. And further on, he says, as tempting as it may be to go on into Iran, Syria, or Myanmar, uh, the American taxpayer needs a well-deserved rest. It's time we focus more on Katrina relief and expanding energy resources here at home. It's time to slowly begin the withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan. Parades and celebrations on main streets of every city and town in America for the victorious American troops are certainly in order. All right, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. Thank you so much for having me, Harry. It's great to be here from Houston Tech. All right. Um, let's begin by you telling us what it is you think is so amazing, what it is you think is uh, so victorious, and why you think this is the most successful military and political campaign. What's happened that's so good for America? The absolute right to vote for the Iraqi people, uh, for their own constitution, for their own elected uh, officials. It took uh, almost a decade for the, the Germans to get this far after World War II. Um, you know, comparing the, the war in Iraq to World War II, for me, it's a tough call. I mean, it's, it's very, very close. Certainly, the two of them are, are the greatest victories, I think, in the history of our entire country. Um, it's just been absolutely amazing, the speed of, of how our military took over Iraq and uh, all the successes they've had, especially building the democracy. So I'm just ecstatic with the, with, you know, there's a lot of things that I can criticize Bush on. I wish he cut taxes more. I wish he cut the spending. But on foreign policy, he's just done an absolutely outstanding job. How many people do you think, how many Iraqis do you think should have to die in order to bring about this democracy? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess we could compare it to our own American Revolutionary War uh, back in uh, 1776. Uh, tens of thousands of people died back then as well. So uh, you, it's got to be a struggle. And it, I, I think I think you compare it to Germany after uh, World War II, after uh, Hitler went down. It's, it's the same sort of thing. It's not not something that's going to come overnight. And, uh, yes, we're going to see a lot of Iraqi deaths, and we're going to see American deaths as well. But I think in the end it's well worth the, uh, the effort. Well, the people who died in 1776 were mostly people who volunteered to fight because they believed in the cause. The tens of thousands of Iraqis who have died in this shock and awe have uh, not volunteered in any way, shape, or form. They are brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, children, uh, neighbors, friends, uh, people who wanted to live their life just as Eric Don Darrow plans on living his life. And even under Saddam Hussein, those people were alive. Uh, those people had certain rights and privileges that they could do. They had jobs. They, they had electricity. They had all sorts of things. And now they're living on rationed electricity in the country that has the second largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, they are struggling. Uh, there is an unemployment rate of about 40%, and most of their friends are dead, and the city of Fallujah is absolutely flattened. And uh, no, none, of, none of them ask for this. As it should be, Harry. I, I, if I have one criticism of George Bush, I actually think he's sort of a, a, a bit of a war whip. He, he, you know, he should have bombed the hell out of Fallujah, and he just, he just he went in there, and he had the troops, the troops go in there, and then he backed off like after three days. It's absolutely insane. But, I mean, if this had happened in World War II or, you know, even in the 1950s in the Korean War, and, you know, we would have never done something like that. Um, done something like what? So, you know, just gone in, uh, gone on the outskirts and for, for two days and then pulled back our troops 
and, and, and not brought in the Air Force and, and bombed the hell out of Fallujah. Uh, that's exactly what we should have done. It's an absolute hotbed for al-Qaeda and terrorism. And uh, Ram- Ramadi as well. There, there are certain cities in Iraq that uh, are not very friendly places to be, and uh, we need to use maximum force to uh, subdue this, uh, the terrorists and uh, the, the opponents to Iraqi democracy. How do you know that they were hotbeds of uh, al-Qaeda? Because South Kauri is hiding out there. And because all his top lieutenants are out there. And I didn't know associated with Al Qaeda. How do I know that Al Qaeda is associated with Al Qaeda? Yeah, uh, how, how do you know any of these things? Because George Bush told you so. No, because I mean, I, I even liberal leftist leaning CNN, you know, reports that. Because but, George I mean, Bush told them so. Well, I don't think you know. I, it, you'd have an argument if it was if it was coming from Fox News, but uh, and the National Review with some right wing publications. But I mean, even CNN, you know. And they, uh, but even CNN has reported from the beginning exactly what George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld have announced on television. If you remember when this whole war started back in in 2003, uh, right across the bottom of the screen on CNN, on MSNBC, on NBC, on ABC, on all of them, it said I, Operation Iraqi Freedom, exactly the way the United States government wanted this war to be painted. It didn't say the invasion of Iraq or the war on Iraq or anything of that sort. It said exactly what George Bush announced the name of the war to be. And they have followed through from the beginning to the end, repeating whatever it is. And when George Bush says, it isn't just us who thinks that, uh, who thought that there were weapons of mass destruction, the whole world thought so. Well, of course the whole world thought so, because the only people who had intelligence on the ground, supposedly in Iraq, was the CIA and the United States government, and they said there were weapons of mass destruction, and so the rest of the world repeated that. Colin Powell said it at the United Nations, and the rest of the world repeated it. It wasn't because Russia had spies in Iraq or because Spain uh, was uh, nosing around uh, Saddam Hussein's palaces or something and came up with this notion that uh, al-Qaeda had training camps and that there were ballistic well, 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 that could attack the United States. Can I, can I jump in? Sure, what, do you mean what, what do you mean notion that al-Qaeda had training camps in Iraq? Uh, nobody's ever found them. Uh, uh, Salman Pack and Alan, Alan Swar? Okay, we've got to take a break. So hold on to that thought. We'll be right back. Yeah, yeah just real quick. Uh, they, they found two terrorist training camps in, in Iraq. Uh, Alan Swar, Al Salam, uh, 20, 20 miles south of Baghdad, and uh, Salman Pack up in northeast Iraq. And, uh, you know, it was a story for like two days on Fox, and CNN kind of just glossed over it, and then we never heard about it again. You know, this is major news, and it was just the liberal biased anti Bush media just glossed right all over it, and like they do with everything else. And real quick, as far as the weapons of mass destruction, I don't even care about that. The weapon of mass destruction was Saddam Hussein, and we were justified to go in there to get rid of him himself. We didn't need to find anything else. The weapon of mass destruction was Hussein. We got him, and for that reason, it was the most successful military victory in our, our nation's history, saved World War II. You don't, it doesn't bother you that your president lied to you? He had to do with, you know, what bothers me about Bush is he has not fought the war hard enough. He's politically correct. He doesn't want to call this war for what it is. It's a war against Islamofascists. And Bush does not want to use that word. If, he, if, if you know, if he's deserving of any criticism, if he's not hardcore enough, he's kind of, he's, you know, playing fiddlywinks with this war. He's, you know, he's not putting enough troops in there. He's not using the air force enough. Um, if, if anything, he, we need, we need a much more hard, harder work forcing Iraq. So, as far as you're concerned, he didn't lie enough. I, I don't care what he did to get us in there. That's beside the point. And he lied I know, about the aluminum tubes. He lied about the mobile laboratories. He lied about the unmanned aircraft. He lied about the ballistic missiles that could threaten the whole Middle East. He lied about the uranium purchases in Africa. He lied about the, they lied about the adventures of Jessica Lynch, the toppling of the Hussein. Oh, where'd that come from? He lied about Jessica Lynch. Yes, they, they lied and said that, that she was killed in battle when she was killed when uh, her Humvee turned over and, and she was. Well, no, Jessica Lynch wasn't killed. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, not what killed, injured. I'm sorry. Uh, and they, they lied about uh, her being her rescued. That the Iraqis had tried to return her to the Americans, and the Americans had, had pushed them back. Oh, and come on. Where are you getting that from? Is this some sort of Michael Moore conspiracy? No, 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 no. This is, Harry, Harry, I, I love you to death, man. This is the first time I've ever heard something like that, that there was a conspiracy around Jessica Lynch? Not a conspiracy. They just simply lied about it. They, they, built, they built a big PR thing out of nothing. She was, she was uh, injured in an accident. She went to an Iraqi hospital. The Iraqis tried to return her hey, to the United States. It wasn't States. Bush that, that brought that up. It was the media. It was the media that made that, not George Bush. No, it was the, the government that announced it, and then the media reported it. And the same thing with the toppling of the I remember those days. Was no, 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 no. It was CNN and Fox News that uncovered that. It wasn't George Bush. If anything, they were like two days late on the story. I think, you know, that, that, you can say a lot of things, but that, that was pretty whack. I, that's the first time I've ever heard about some sort of conspiracy. No, no, no I didn't say conspiracy. I'm just saying that, they, that uh, the government just built a big PR story out of nothing. Same with Pat Tillman. Uh, the same with the idea that Hussein kicked the U.N. inspectors out of Iraq when he didn't. It was Clinton that pulled them out because they uh, uh, they knew what? that they were going to start bombing Iraq. Wait, wait a second. What, what sort of build-up is there about Pat Tillman? He was a football star that got, that got killed in action. I mean, what, Right, what, and, and the United States government made it sound like he died a hero in battle when, in fact, of course he, he killed, died a hero. He was sorry, killed by, Harry, he was killed by vet, I, that, may, that may be. You're a veteran, and I respect your military stuff. Oh, God, don't I, give I, me the veteran stuff. I was I'm, a veteran, I'm a veteran as well. I had four years in the Navy. I, I, I understand you served three years in the Army, and I... 
I absolutely respect you for that. Don't respect you. me for that. I was drafted. I did everything I could to stay out of KP guard well, you, duty. Everything. Yeah, you, still, you, still, you still showed up and you still do your serve. And I'm 100% opposed to the draft. But I, look, I still respect you for that. And you know, as a Bell veteran, you know, that uh, anybody that gets killed, I don't care if it's friendly fire or anything, they're a hero in my eyes. Well, but the U.S. government had to make it into something it wasn't. All right, let's go to right, the phone. Uh, Alex Jones is on the phone. Good evening, Alex. Thanks for calling in. Hey, guys. I, I just. Uh, Got off work and I got in the car to listen to you on 100.1 in Austin area. I had to call him. I'm going to be, I'm try to be calm. Uh, since then, this guy, I, I just want to say it's all a big photo. You can tell it, it, it's a joke. To say, we just take this from where we just ended back to where it started every millisecond. Patent bull. Number one, Jessica Lynch said it was all a fable. Jerry Bruckheimer, two days before, right when the Iraqi said Republican guards pulled out, come get your people. They got a hold, uh, and, and Bruckheimer's talked about this, by the way. It's on the BBC Associated Press. They hired Bruckheimer. Uh, who consults for the Pentagon to script the special forces, how to kick the doors down, how to act like it was a rescue. That's public. She's written a book about it now. It's totally known. They're saying the sun didn't go up this morning. That Tillman, his father and his mother, are totally outraged because they killed him in friendly fire, and then they told him to shut up, and they told people on his team to shut up, and the Rangers screwed up and killed him with friendly fire, and it's a total cover-up. They told the family to cover up because it would boost enlistment, and some of it shows that Somebody they've actually gotten rid of him because he was angry about not being able to go after the Taliban. Now, let's rewind here to say that CNN, to say that CNN, you know, are the ones reporting about Sarkari and all this. CNN is off of the very same military industrial complex that makes hundreds of billions off these wars. They give us fake left and fake right. It's like Hillary Clinton every week having four-hour dinners uh, with, with, with uh, Rupert Murdoch. It, it's like Bill Clinton being a surrogate son of the Bushes. This is all staged to keep us in these two parties. You know, it's liberals at the supposed New York Times who come out with the aluminum tube that turns out they're on the payroll. Last year, the Congressional Budget Office said that one of the media buys, Bush made $244 million in fake newscasts that I've seen and here in Austin. The great leader cares about you. The people clap and they cut it in. Fake newscasts, all these fake reporters on the payroll. And, buddy, I'm telling you something right now. We're going to defend this republic for people like you. But, Joseph, at least you're honest. At least you're honest. Because you'll come out and say you love the lion, you love the evil, you love it all, while Bush goes after the Second Amendment, gets rid of our borders, doubles the borders. Wait a second. Wait a second. I, you know what? You're not honest. I'm not a Let me finish. I've been listening to you for 30 minutes. I yeah, we, uh, I'm sorry we got a break on both of you here because uh, the music's playing. But when we come back, let Alex finish, and then, Eric, you'll have all the time in the world to, to rebut him. Well, just in closing, the reason I'm angry is because, you know, I've had to make emergency preparations to get my family out of the country. If, you know, if we have to. I'm going to stay behind and fight this thing. Ron Paul, Vietnam veteran, most conservative voting record in the Congress, says the government may be preparing for martial law and total gun confiscation. Ray McGovern, top CIA analyst for Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr., has said it. And now on C-SPAN, we've confirmed it two days ago, the former chief of staff for Secretary of State Powell, uh, has said that the government may be planning martial law in the takeover. We're actually talking about Nazi Germany. We're actually talking about the end of the country. I love this country, and there's all these smirking, smacking, giggling fools. You know, I hear them on the radio now saying that the government never even said that there were WMDs. You know, it, it's just double think. And I love this country. Our government created Saddam in 58. The CIA hired him when he was 18 years old as a hitman. He killed a lot of people. They made him security chief in 68, the head, the bad party in 79. And they told him to go ahead and invade Kuwait. They gave him the money to attack Iran. And he's just a wind-up toy. And it's just so sad to see our boys and our girls dying over there for a total fraud. And this guy says, you know, they're over there playing tiddlywinks. Well, you tell back to the quad amputees. Hey, Harry, you really enjoyed the show. I don't know how you can stomach listen to this. But uh, just uh, God bless you, and I'm over and out. Okay, thanks for calling, Alex. And, Eric, uh, you're on. What's up, Alex? I happen to be a veteran, okay? Four years in the United States Navy, all four years out to sea, and a lot of that time in the Persian Gulf, I have three medals for, for war, war service as well. So uh, I'm a member of the VFW and the American Legion. But let me tell you something. It's a volunteer armed forces, all volunteers. These guys are not drafted. And uh, anybody who's been in the military for the last 20 years knows that there's a possibility that you might die in, a, you know, in, in some war zone. You all know that going in. When we sign a contract, we know that going in. Let me tell you something else. I would gladly give my life for my country, as I'm sure a lot of these people would as well. So, uh, and Alex, I worked for Congressman Paul for 12 years. I was a senior aide in the district. I know often quite well where you live. Our district stretched out there uh, for about four years. So uh, don't tell me about Ron Paul. You know, he, I'll say something about Ron Paul. When he first ran for Congress in 1996, he ran as Mr. Military. He had me, his top veteran on his staff, go to every little BFW hall in the district and the American Legion and, and play up about how pro-military he was. And, how, and, and he himself did. Now, look, I respect Ron. He, he did six years in the Air Force. You know, he's got the medals himself. But uh, then he turns around and he takes a completely left-hand turn. And that's why I quit his office. I don't work for him anymore. But precisely because of that, because when, when 9-11 happened, it changed everything. And Ron just went off way off at the left field into crazy Cindy Sheehan, Michael Moore territory. I don't know what he's thinking today. I don't know where his head is at. Well, I can tell you one thing about it, and that is that he is pro-national defense 
He is not pro-national defense, Harry. Absolutely opposed to national offense, and he has made that distinction very. We were attacked, Harry. We were attacked. There are three thousand Americans that are dead in New York City. Who who attacked us? Al Qaeda. All right, and uh, what, what country is what country is Al Qaeda? They're all over the place. They're in Iraq. So, they're so in Afghanistan. They're in Pakistan. They're, they're, they're in Saudi Arabia. So that means any of these countries can be attacked by the United absolutely, States. Absolutely, absolutely. And if I have any criticism of George Bush, if he's just been a complete war win, he, he just all he wants to do is Afghanistan and Iraq, and he lets Pakistan off the hook, he lets Saudi Arabia off the hook, he lets the Jordanians off the hook. Harry, did you see what the Iranian president said two days ago? The newly elected guy, who, who by the way was involved in a hostage crisis back in the 1970s, he said Israel should be wiped off the face of the planet. I'm sure you heard the news on that, right? Well, that's his opinion. That's his opinion. This is the president of Iran. Okay. This is a, a, a nuclear power. I mean, we are fighting the, all the Islamic fascists in the entire Middle East. Well, Eric, George Bush, all he wants to do is, is, is keep this in Iraq and Afghanistan. Let me tell you something, George. This has to do with Saudi Arabia as well. It has to do with Pakistan and uh, Jordan, uh, the Jordanians, Syria, and Iran. Well, the only difference between what the president of Iran is saying and what Eric Dondero is saying about Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Libya, and so forth, is that uh, Eric Dondero is not the head of a country. Uh, yeah, and Eric Dondero doesn't have his finger on the button of nuclear weapons. Yeah, I guess that's a big difference. But, uh, but, hey, but you want to wipe these countries off the face of the earth also? No, I want to, I want to wipe the Islamofascists off the face of the earth. Well, anybody and has anything to do with al-Qaeda, and anybody who's harboring terrorists, no matter where they're at. Just real quick, Gary, uh, you know, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression here. You and I probably agree on, like, 95% of all the issues, a particular foreign policy. I mean, look at the foreign of the U.N. The areas that libertarians uh, can agree on, I think we should work together on that. And, uh, you know, we just happen to disagree on how best to fight the war in Paris. Well, we disagree on what I believe is the most fundamental characteristic of a libertarian, and that is a libertarian does not believe that force can solve anything, that the only answer is peace and uh, goodwill and diplomacy, and that persuasion is the mark of a civilized society. And not only have you advocated shock and awe to solve the world's problems, but I noticed an a email that you sent to an email <clears throat> list in which you said that flag burning should be legal, but that anybody who's a, uh, in the armed forces or a veteran should have the right to kick the S out of any flag burner and should be legal. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, they, they, they introduced that piece of legislation in the Louisiana legislature. I fully support it. Absolutely. What, what do you think that would accomplish? Uh, it would stop the uh, flag burners from uh, desecrating our flag. That's what it would do. Okay, Look, well, Harry, Harry, let me just say this. Look, being a libertarian does not exclude one from being patriotic and loving one's country, Harry. I mean, that's what you seem to be suggesting here, that a well, libertarian well, why, does not why, love... why do you equate uh, flag burning with hating one's country? Why do you uh, equate opposing Bush's foreign policy with anti-Americanism? And anti it is anti-Americanism. No, it, it is, is absolutely. Harry, 3,000 Americans died on September 11, 2001. How would you have responded to that? Would you say that Iran, that Iraq did it? Iraq did not. Iraq do it. absolutely did it. That is the biggest myth. Iraq did not. On Michael Moore and George Soros and Hillary Clinton and all these leftists who want to pretend like Iraq had nothing to do with it. They absolutely had something to do with it. What evidence do you have that Iraq had anything Sal to do with Curry. it? Sal Curry. Let's now get to Francis in Brooklyn, New York. Francis, it's all yours now. Thank you very much. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to say this. I'm sort of appalled by the arrogance and the uh, uh, cavalier attitude regarding this illegal and unconstitutional war. It has taken over the lives of 125,000 Iraqi men, women, and civilian and children, and uh, virtually bankrupted our economy. Uh, several points I want to clarify, since context is so important when we discuss uh, a war or national security. Number one, uh, the, the comment that I heard about al-Qaeda being centered in Fallujah, uh, we really don't know if that's true or not. We do know that Fallujah is probably the second most holy city in Iraq, and our blitzkrieg upon it is actually a direct uh, attack on Islam, which is very, very sad. Not only does it hurt Americans, but it also... Uh, makes it sort of a war of cultures, which is so reprehensible in a free and democratic society. I want to specify, too, the concept that al-Qaeda was created by the U.S. government and the CIA during the illegal war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan that uh, Ronald Reagan had committed about $3.8 billion to in 1981. In fact, al-Qaeda was named by the uh, CIA uh, gentleman operating uh, the war uh, on behalf of the United States. His name is Milt Bearden. He wrote two books about it where he talks about uh, backing the Taliban and how uh, the Taliban and uh, the CIA were able to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan. So that's a matter of historical record. So when we talk about al-Qaeda being behind this or that, we find out that Osama bin Laden, who is the uh, head of al-Qaeda, uh, was supported by the U.S. government for nine years. And I remember Ronald Reagan on three occasions on his radio show on Saturday calling al-Qaeda a great patriot in the tradition of Patrick Henry. And that's a matter of public record. Secondly, what I want to say about the war is that it's, it was an illegal war. We went to war without adequate evidence. We violated our own laws that we enforced after World War II at Nuremberg. Uh, specifically, uh, Ribbentrop was executed not for exterminating Jews or for uh, uh, creating slave labor, but he was executed at Nuremberg for violating treaties and international law. 
what the United States has done, we violated the territorial sovereignty of uh, Iraq. Uh, it looks like we're going to do the same thing in Iran. Uh, we, were, we had set up, uh, as Alex Jones had mentioned earlier, we had backed Saddam Hussein in 1959, and uh, also the comment that was made about the weapons of mass destruction being used by Clinton for the first time actually goes back to Bush 41 in the Gulf War. Francis, can I ask you yeah. a question? So how would you have responded to September 11th? I would say, as I said on Art Bell's show two days after uh, 9-11, that what we have to do before we go to attack countries, we have to find out what actually happened. Uh, if you remember Vietnam, nine years after we lost Vietnam, the CIA discloses the fact that the Maddox was never hit. The Gulf of the Tonkin incident was a fabrication. We okay, went from okay, again, again Francis, how would you have responded to nine, uh, the attacks on 9-11? I would, I, would I would have examined the evidence, and I would not have... No, 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 how would you have responded militarily? Militarily, how would you have responded? You said that we had to respond militarily. You oh, just, my God, you, I'm dealing with a bunch I did not say that, Alex. Oh, I, no, I'm sorry. Say, Gary, I did not say that. Hold it, hold it, hold it. It's getting chaotic. Francis, uh... What, what did you want to say? I wanted to say this. Before we go to war, we have to have all the evidence, and we have to have Congress approve uh, an act of war. We yeah, have to have... New York, right? Let me finish. Let me finish. I want, York, right? the legal, I want to go through the Constitution and the legal but framework of the U.S. Right? as a civilized nation. We didn't Call do that in this instance. We didn't do okay, that in this instance. All right, we got it. Francis lives Thank in New York, and that means Francis should act emotionally, and he should want an act of retribution, <laughs> even if it's against, even if against you, the wrong people. Somebody hits you, Harry. You hit them a hundred times harder. You hit them back a hundred times harder. Being a libertarian does not mean you need to be a whip. All right, That's the Eric, problem with our movement, Harry. If Eric, we, we Eric, gotta... Eric, you made your point. Now let me make a point. If you hit me and I hit you back, that is retribution. That is uh, defense. If you hit me and I hit your sister, that's not retribution. That's not defense. That's an act of aggression. And to okay, just swing out, wild, swing out wildly at the first person that you can get your hands on is not an act of rationality or anything else. It is an act of emotion that can only bring further bad consequences. Well, you don't think Al-Qaeda attacked us on September 11th? Is I don't think we attack? attacked Al-Qaeda after September 11th. I yeah, think we attacked the nation of Afghanistan and killed tens of thousands of innocent people. Correct. And where was Al-Qaeda hiding? Some of them were in Afghanistan, some of them were in Pakistan, uh, some of them were in the United States. You know, all 19 of those people who attacked the World Trade Center were in the United States. Should we have bombed New York? So we didn't kill any al-Qaeda in, in, in Afghanistan. Is that what you're saying? We killed some, and we killed a lot of innocent people. It's a fearless object mentality that it doesn't matter how many innocent people you kill. If you kill one guilty person, then that's worth a thousand innocent people. How would you have responded then? How, how would you have gone after I can tell you how I would have responded because I wrote articles starting on September 12th, and I said that this is a criminal act and that these people should be hunted down and, and uh, oh, captured yeah, and I prosecuted. I can't believe I'm in the same movement with you. That's Bill Clinton. That's Bill Clinton. That's a Democrat response. That's Harry, right, you're, that's you're not, not a libertarian. libertarian. That's, you're a Democrat. You're a lefty Democrat. You're not a libertarian. God, this is the whole life. You've got to trouble all these years. Yeah, for 10 years, that was, that's what Bill Clinton did. And that's why I no, had him at Wait a today. second. What did Bill Clinton do? He, he responded illegally. He didn't respond militarily, Harry. God. Do you think Man, that the I can't answer, believe I'm in the same that, movement with people like you. Do you think the answer to everything is violence and force? You think the only way to, to cure problems is with violence? I, I believe if somebody hits me in the nose, I'm going to hit them in the nose, too. No, you, no, 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 no. Wait a second, Eric. You don't want to hit him in the nose. You want to hit someone in the nose. And it doesn't matter whether it's guilty or innocent as long as you Harry, can hit someone saying, in the nose. Look, honestly, saying Al-Qaeda was not in Afghanistan is really, really nuts. Who said I, that? I don't even think somebody like Michael Moore would say something like Who that. Who said that? You just said that. I did not. You said, I, said oh, some of them were in Af I said some of them were in Afghanistan, some were in Pakistan, and some were in the United Come States. Come on! That is so weird. I mean, even the most hardcore left-wing Democrat admits that, that uh, Al-Qaeda was stationed in Afghanistan. That some of them were there and some of them were in some Pakistan. Of them. What do you mean, some of them? 80 to 90 percent of them were. No, there's, there's, no evidence all over the country. there's no evidence to that. Oh, that you number. guys are crazy. No, it's... Well, you didn't God, want to wait for hey, Eric, you didn't want to wait for the evidence. You just wanted to kill somebody. And that would make you feel good. And now we're going to take a break and let us all calm down a little. And Francis, I thank you for your call. We're going to move on when we come back and talk with Bill in California and see what he has to say. Well, I wish that soothing music would calm the emotions of those who feel that they must act upon emotion and sudden revenge rather than on the long-term consequences of one's acts. And with that, I will take us now to Arizona to talk. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to California to talk with Bill. And uh, Bill, what's on your mind tonight? Uh, Harry, I just wanted to make it perfectly clear to all your listeners that Eric Dondero does not in any way speak on behalf of the Republican Liberty Caucus. None of the positions he has expressed have been taken by the RLC. He has not been an officer in the RLC for at least 12 years, and the RLC has a very specific position on national defense that does not correspond with anything. There he can say. Are you a member of the RLC? I am the national chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus. Oh, my I'm God. Bill Westmiller. Bill Westmiller. Well, I appreciate your calling in. Eric, do you want to respond to that? Uh, and quite a controversial national chairman he is. My email box every day is full with emails from people who are very, very disappointed in how Bill's run in this organization. I founded this group back in 1990 specifically to be a pro-defense, pro-America, libertarian group within the Republican Party. And Bill has turned this, the ERLC into this 
this, uh, you know, kind of uh, almost left-wing libertarian group. And look, Bill, I'm, I'm telling you, man, there are a lot of people that are very, very upset with how, how you're running the RLC these days. You need to stay neutral on, on the issue of foreign policy. Uh, let me ask you something, Eric. Uh, what other issues does Bill take a left-wing stance on? Uh, nothing as far as, you know, as far as uh, civil liberties and free enterprise, he's perfectly fine as far as I'm concerned. Well, then maybe you shouldn't call him a left-wing... Uh... Yes, he is absolutely left-wing. If, if, if he is anti-American and anti-war in Iraq, that is left-wing, Harry. I'm Are you sorry. anti-American, Bill? <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let me make clear that I'm, I'm the national chairman, but I don't speak on behalf of the organization. I have my own views, personally, which are very close to yours, Harry, uh, as far as the Iraq war is concerned. But the IRLC has not taken any position on the, on the Iraq wars per se. What it has done is adopted a position on national defense, which is available on our website, which anybody can read. And I can read you two sentences out of that... Uh, you? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, we favor foreign military action only upon a declaration of war by Congress in the face of an imminent and clear threat to the United States. We favor a clear strategy for entrance into and conclusion of any foreign engagement and a definable goal that constitutes victory. Here we go. Well, and I would say that, that, that uh, would fit in the libertarian platform just as easily. And, in fact, what Eric said before would, too. We are uh, libertarians are pro-defense, pro-America, and pro-proper uh, constitutional response to any attack on the United States. Well, you're talking about emails. I have an email from Eric in which he uh, urges the Bush administration to drop a nuclear bomb on NECA. Really? <laughs> Did you do that, Eric? Uh, perhaps. Uh, probably about two to three months ago. Mm-hmm. Do you think that would solve anything? I think I think somebody hits me and somebody kills 3,000 of my fellow Americans, I'm going to hit them back 1,000 times harder. And they hit me. You mean to kill 1,000 as many? I don't care who it is. I don't care. Look, let's get back to the main point here. 3,000 Americans died in New York City. Why is it that so many libertarians like you don't even care about that, Harry? We care about it mightily, and we don't want it to happen again. And if you kill 300,000, if you kill 300,000 innocent Arabs, then it is going to happen again. That's not the point. We we don't want it to happen again. Of course we don't want it to happen again. The point is revenge. How are we going to uh, respond to the attack that they they put upon our nation? Well, Well, it seems like you don't even care about that. You know, oh, let's, let's talk to the nice little Islamo fascist. You think, you think the Americans wanted to talk to Hitler in 1944 and 1945? They wanted to eliminate the guy. We why need to do, do the same with bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Why do you keep putting words in my mouth and saying things like, I don't care about 3,000 people dying? The fact I that never, I don't agree with your solution to it does not mean I don't care about it. You're saying your everybody. way or the highway, and anybody who thinks differently is anti-American, pro-Iraq, uh, pro-3,000 deaths in New York, uh, doesn't care about innocent people dying, only he cares about tens of thousands of Iraqis dying, dying who had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, but you seem to think that Baghdad, force huh? and violence is going to solve everything. That's why Top Cowley's in Baghdad. He goes, yeah, sure, the dumb saying had nothing to do with 9-11. Yeah, right. That's why all these al-Qaeda people are in Baghdad in Fallujah and Ramadi. I think Eric is blinded by his absolute base hatred of anything to do with Muslims. Uh, and it blinds him to the facts. It blinds him to any kind of rational principles of uh, foreign policy. It blinds him to anything. He would just assume the administration conducts a holy war crusade against all Muslims everywhere in the world. Well, what do you think would happen, Bill, if, if the Islamofascists took over America? Look, I'm here in Houston. I talk to them. I speak Spanish about them, my Mexican students all the time. They're telling me that the Coyotes are bringing these guys across the border because they're paying more money. What, what do you think? What, what's going to happen? What's going to be the result of our civil liberties in this country if the Islamic fascists take over our country? And how are they going to do that? They're coming across the border, Harry. I'm here in Houston. You're in Tennessee. I'm five hours away from the border. I speak Spanish. You don't. I know what's going on here. They're My coming across the border. The is muy mal. Okay. Oh, uh, well, okay. Please. <laughs> look, what is going to happen to our personal liberties? If these, look, look at Dearborn, Michigan. Look at the, the, the Hamtramck, Michigan. They've already started passing laws up there to close our civil liberties. And the, and the two Islamofascist bastions in the United States. Yeah, well, uh, they've got a long way to go before they're going to take over this country, uh, and you know that as well as I do. I do not know that. All right, Bill, a- thank, Bill, thanks so much for your call. We're going to go now to Dave in Arizona. Dave, are you with us? Good to hear from you. Good to talk to you. Thank you. What's on your I, mind? I uh, don't normally call radio shows because I'm kind of shy, but and I've also got a cold, so I hope we don't have to get into a shouting match. Okay, just don't sneeze in my ear. <laughs> uh, there are three points I wanted to make. Uh, first of all, regarding Afghanistan, the government told us we, the war would be over in the winter, and uh, it's been five years. I guess they just didn't tell us which winter it was going to be over. <laughs> that's right. Four years, but that's all right. Four years? Okay. Um, well, it'll be five. You can be sure of that. And I'd like to know why we're still in Afghanistan. Um, the second point I want to make yeah. is, that, is that this is not a volunteer army. That, that your guest said we have a volunteer army today. And when we offer enticements to people such as a college education and other things that help them get out of rough situations in life, we, we go beyond. It's not really a free uh, volunteer army, in my view. And then we don't let them out when the time when their enlistment is up. Right. Can I make one quick point? Or are we out of time? Uh, why don't you wait till after the break? There's, there's so much confusion about whether the war in Iraq had to do with al-Qaeda or not. And the, the government, all major people in the government said it had nothing to do with al-Qaeda until we didn't find any, any weapons of mass destruction. And then that changed. Bush himself said that in one of his few so-called news conferences, that we had, the wars were not connected. 
And now you, you see that people are, are saying, you know, really believing that this is why we're over there to stop al-Qaeda. That wasn't the case. Yes, he said in one of his speeches that, no, we never said that uh, al-Qaeda and Iraq were connected, and I don't want anybody to think I said that, when in fact he hinted at it uh, a few times in his speeches. When he needed to. Yes. Right. Uh, Eric, what do you want to say? Uh, that's, uh, actually, that's part of the problem with Bush, is he does not want to make that connection, and I don't, for the life of me, don't understand that. Uh, just real quick, the, uh, the, his drop in the polls and the drop in the support of the war in Iraq, that's not coming from any lefties that are that are opposed to the war in Iraq. That's from coming from people like me who, who oppose Bush's uh, the way he's been conducting the war. We're, we're, getting sick, yeah, we're getting sick and tired of it. And if a pollster asked me, "Do you support the war in Iraq?" I'd, I'd answer no because the way he's conducting this war, that's where he's losing all his support. He's losing his support on the right. And uh, I suppose that, I guess we're 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 winding down. And the only thing I want to say is that, but I don't want anybody to get the, the impression that the you know uh, libertarians hold a single view on the on foreign policy. We all are in agreement, all libertarians, that we should get out of the United Nations and end foreign aid. I think, you know, we have a massive disagreements on, on the war in Iraq and, and responding to September 11th. But, Harry, you know, look, you and I, I consider you a, a comrade in the, in the libertarian movement. You and I should be concentrating on getting the Congress to stop foreign aid, getting us out of the United Nations. And, then, you know, if we have differences on this, you know, perhaps we can put them aside. And I just say, as far as responding to September 11th, if I hit you and you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. And where does that end? <laughs> oh, that's uh, deeply philosophical. But let me ask you, where would you have, have, have uh, how would you have responded to September 11th? I think so nothing? You, I think you try to respond to the people directly. You don't attack countries. So would you have sent the troops into Afghanistan? I may have sent some forces into Afghanistan. I wouldn't have bombed the hell out of people who live in the Stone Age. And don't you think that the Islamic fascists would take that and say, well, look at those Americans. They're cowering in fear. You know this? <laughs> yes, right. Cowering no, I don't in think fear so. just because they didn't bomb the whole world. You don't think they would respond, look at it that way? So no. you think, do you think they, they, they're afraid of us now? I think they are. Yes, absolutely. They're stunned. Look at that. So they won't attack that, us again. Is that correct? Look at that letter that came out. It was about five or six weeks ago. They discovered that letter from uh, from the number two guy in Al Qaeda in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, and it just uh, Kauri. And what do you say? And he was like, you know, like the funds are depleted. The, the the Americans are actually doing a lot better than we thought. Yeah, they're they're on the run right now. They, we haven't had a terrorist attack on this on this nation since uh, September 11th. I think. Well, on September 11th, bit. we hadn't had a terrorist attack in 12 years. Oh well. Uh, since, uh, since 1993. So we have the USS Cole, we have Tanzania, we have Kenya, the, the bombings in there, we have the, uh, the, uh, the military barracks. But not an attack on the United States. Yeah, you know, uh, it's During right, the past right. of uh, Clinton years, we had no attacks on the United States. Because we had Oklahoma City. City. Because the that one was, on World Trade Center basement. We had Oklahoma City, and that was 1995. Oh, yeah. Hey, wait a second. That. Boy, you just brought up a wonderful point. When Timothy McVeigh brought down the uh, Murrah building in um, Oklahoma City, should we have attacked, attacked Oklahoma for that? Do you think that Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols acted alone? You don't think anybody else was involved in that area? Well, according to you, there was probably an al-Qaeda plot. We should have attacked There absolutely Oklahoma. was an al-Qaeda plot. There it absolutely was. was. Read the book by Jana Davis, the third terrorist. Jana Davis was the first, the first reporter on the scene from CBS News in Oklahoma City. You ask anybody in Oklahoma City the question, do you think Terry Nichols and, and Timothy McVeigh acted alone? And they will tell you straight, I live here. Terry, I know. I go to Oklahoma all the time. They did not do it alone. Iraqi intelligence was behind it. Al-Qaeda was behind it. And, and Bush should be blamed for covering up for Clinton on this. And we should have attacked Oklahoma. Ah. <laughs> Why not? We're going to attack somebody. You think we're going to stand still and let those Islamo-fascists think that we're going to be uh, whipped in the face like that? No, he should have gotten Bin Laden when he had the chance. Clinton had the chance in 1998. The, uh, the Sudanese said, here he is. You but can that's just him. Monday morning quarterbacking. That does, you can say that about a lot of things. Okay, well, look, uh, Dave, I appreciate you bringing these points up. We're going to move on now to Nick in uh, New Hampshire because we're running out of time, and we've got... Uh, some people you have to talk to. So, Nick in New Hampshire, you with us? I am, Aaron. Hey, Good. Hey. Thanks for calling. What's on, on uh, your mind tonight? Well, but thank you for having me on. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just you know, say to Mr. Vondero, um, I certainly appreciate you know you for coming on the program and you know standing up for your views um, at a time when the support for the war is uh, you know ebbing. Yes, and, and so you're one against. The, uh, uh, I mean, well, I think that you know Admiral, if you do that, and I can you know, think back, you know, three years ago when those of us who opposed the war were in the minority, and we were called everything from you know apologists to un-Americans to uh, you know, socialists because with that we didn't want to you know, bomb the people. Um, so. I mean, in fact, now you guys are in the minority. I can certainly appreciate the fact that, you know, you're staying up your views while other people who agree with you are not. So I do have a question about your underlying, you know, your philosophy, because in the beginning of the program, I think either you or Harry said you're a neo-libertarian. And I don't know if Harry or his listeners are familiar with, you know, the term neo-libertarian, but having visited some of these websites like, you know, Confederate Yankee and Quando.net, you know, these sites don't really strike me as very, very libertarian. And I just, I'm curious, are you, do you consider yourself a libertarian, or do you think the term neo-libertarian and libertarian are separate? Absolutely fantastic question. Um, the, the term neo-libertarian was sort of came about in the early 1990s. I come from the Libertarian Party. I was a big, big-time activist in the, in the LP in the 1980s. I was a Libertarian National Committee, and I got disgruntled in 1989 and 1990. Went off and formed the Republican Liberty Caucus out of Florida. Um, and because of what? Well, you know, Harry, how it goes, Harry. You know, purges, Michael Emerling, Cloud. 
you know, and all the inner battles and stuff like that. And I just, uh, you know, things weren't going well for the LP. You know, they, they lost some state legislative seats, and, you know, but that's, that's another show. But uh, the, the neo-libertarian, I think if you just think of T.J. O'Rourke, he's the absolute uh, neo-libertarian. Neo-libertarian means somebody who's very, very fiscally conservative, somebody who's very, very socially tolerant, pro-choice. I, myself, am very pro-choice abortion, and it uh, and, and means somebody who's hardcore in defense. And we're going to uh, go to New Orleans and talk with Mark, who has a question, for I imagine, for our guest, Eric Dondero. Good evening, Mark. Yes, good evening. Uh, Eric, Mark, I, I, are you going to speak to Eric in Spanish or English? Uh, I'll speak to him in English. Uh, I, I, I don't want him to send a hit squad after me. He <laughs> <laughs> you know, had or something. <laughs> but uh, Eric, so I, I take it then you don't like Bush because he hasn't murdered enough innocent people to uh, to satisfy your you know your desire to just kill people. Is, 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 do I have it? Do I understand you correctly? No, no, I said no. Not. Oh, and, <laughs> and well, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought that you said that uh, he you're disappointed in him because he hasn't killed. Quite enough people in, in Iraq, right? That, that, I has, thought that's what I heard you say. He has not gone after Al Qaeda and uh, the, the Iraqi insurgents that are against the Iraqi democracy with enough force. That is correct. Uh, well, let me ask you this: Why sh- why should we go after Al Qaeda? Wow. <laughs> I, what's your name? Which you're in New Orleans, right? Mark. Mark. I I don't know where you were at on uh, September 11, 2001, but I was here in Houston. I was you were here. here. Did you yes. did you t- maybe turn on the news at all? Yes, I did. Watch Fox News and CNN. Yes, I did. did. Did you see what happened on that yes, day? Yes, I did. What is your point? The point is, be an American, dude. Don't be a whip. You know, being, you're being, you're being like, I asked you, ask you a question. Why should we go after Al-Qaeda? Because they attacked us and killed 3,000 of our brothers hell, and sisters. But why in the hell did they attack us? Why I don't care. It doesn't, I don't why know. did they do it? They, 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 don't, do they, they don't want to do it. Wait a second. 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 Mark asked, uh, why, why should we go after Al Qaeda? Uh, Eric answered that, and then Mark responds. Okay, my answer is, why, why, did Al- why did they attack us on September 11th? Because they hate Hollywood, they hate Madonna, they hate their envious of our wealth, they hate everything about American culture. They want to do us in, they want to destroy us. Well, they, they want us to be just like them. They want all our women to wear burkas from head to toe. They want to eliminate all our movies, MTV, for, uh, Madonna, you know, they're just gays and lesbians. They're going to be the first to go under an Eric. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Osama bin Laden told you all this? Eric, I can I can read it. I can I can I can see in all their pronouncements and and in the way they their lifestyle Eric, over there and they live. I've been over the Middle East. Okay, uh, uh, Mark, what do you have to say? Yes, let me educate you about something, uh, Eric. If Harry Brown would have been elected in the year 2000, we would still we would have had our hamburgers and Madonna and you know I don't know why you would want to have Madonna, but you would still have her. And all these things that you're talking about, yet there wouldn't have been what happened September 11th. You know why? They would have just sold it and gone back to their countries, wouldn't have committed suicide. They would have just enjoyed life the way we were, if Harry Brown would have been elected. That's a bit Pollyannish. But uh, but you you know, hey. and your ilk chose to elect that fascist George Bush, and that's the reason uh, for what happened in September 11 of 2001. Wow, George Bush is a fascist. That, that statement like that is really going to win, a, win us libertarians a lot of votes in and, the mainstream America. And, and, the, and the thing is, the solution is in finding out why people hate us. Mark, have you ever wondered why we libertarians can't get anybody elected? And, and the reason is because of people like you. Who want if you, to if you call George Bush a fascist, you're going to turn off that nice little middle class uh, mother of four in, in, in Dayton, Ohio. Look, okay, dude, that's not okay Eric, we got that point that uh, this is going to turn them off. Mark, thank you very much for your comments. I'm going to make one comment on uh, what Eric said about libertarians getting elected. When are the Republican libertarians in Congress going to propose something that will end the two-party monopoly and stop such things as ballot access laws, campaign finance laws, uh, debate commission, and all of these other things that perpetuate a two-party system by legislation rather than po- popular demand. That's and then you will see whether libertarians have any popular support. Excellent question. Uh, you know, actually, have to, perhaps you should have Bill Lesnar on, the National Chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus, and address that to him. I'm not deeply invo- I'm not involved in a day-to-day basis with the RLC these days. I haven't been for a few years since I left Ron Paul's office. But, but you do have Ron Paul there in Congress. You do have Jeff Blake from Arizona, another libertarian. I would suggest that the Libertarian Party uh, meet with Ron and, and Jeff Blake and have them introduce legislation. I will say this. Leon Gerlach, the state legislator up in Michigan, has in you know, he's the Libertarian Republican state legislator up in Michigan, and he has helped the Libertarian Party of Michigan out greatly with ballot access. So, uh, Eric, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hey, uh, great, you guys. I'm off to Hollywood, a Halloween party now. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Hey. Thanks, thanks so much, and I will be back to wrap this up in just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. This is Harry Brown. Well, this has been a lively show tonight, probably the liveliest we have had since I've been on the Genesis Communications Network. And... Um, it points up something about libertarians, some libertarians, who want to pick and choose among libertarian principles. Now, I didn't get a chance, because we were so preoccupied with the Iraq War, I didn't get a chance to go into other issues, like farm subsidies and welfare and these other things that 
uh, on which uh, Eric would have said he agreed 100% with me. The question would be, why did he agree 100% on those? And I would have tried, if we had the time, I would have tried to pin him down as to what was the underlying principle that he objected to in all of these other government programs. And somewhere down there, if we keep tracing it back to its source, we've got to find that it is wrong to take by force something that belongs to one person and give it to another, whether it is that person's property, whether it is that person's civil liberties, whether it is that person's life. It is wrong to take from one and give to another. It is wrong to use force to solve social or political problems, no matter how good you think the outcome will be, no matter how exemplary you think the ends are, the means do not justify force. And as a result, it would be wrong for our government to get involved using force in any area, taking guns away from people so that they can't protect themselves, whatever it may be. And it is just as wrong in foreign affairs to take away the lives, the property, the civil liberties, the enjoyment of life, the breath of life from innocent Iraqi people, innocent Afghan people, innocent people anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter how many people were killed on September 11. It doesn't justify killing innocent people. It justifies only apprehending those who were responsible for it, prosecuting them, and sentencing them to whatever is the appropriate penalty. And that's what should have been done as a result of September 11. And if Eric would have allowed it, I think several people who called would have made that point. Certainly I would have. Uh, at the root of libertarianism is the idea that force is not the answer to any social or political problem. If there's a problem, it is always that there is too much force, too much government, and what we need is less of it. And if we had had less government before September 11, if we had had less meddling in foreign affairs, we would have not had September 11. We would not have lost 3,000 innocent Americans, whom I grieve for mightily. Well, this is Harry Brown. I hope you'll be back next week. I hope uh, we don't have as lively a discussion next week, but I hope you enjoy it. Do tune in uh, and do have a good week and do something useful and beneficial for yourself and your family this week. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.